Good morning, Missouri Street. We're so glad to have this opportunity to uh, say good morning to you. We are the Hicksons, and um, we heard that you guys are celebrating 80 years of being a congregation. That's amazing, 80 years. You know, during those 80 years, we had the opportunity to serve with you guys for a few of those years. And so I thought the Hicksons would come up with the 10 most favorite things we have about Missouri Street. So... The 10 favorite most things. Number, Number one. one. The food pantry, hanging out with Mr. Larry, Miss Kathy, and distributing food. Number, Number two. two. Sunday Bible class, donuts with Miss Lita. Number, Number three. Sermons with Brother Smith, bringing us the word. Number, Number four. four. With my night meals. Kitchen crew. Fellowship. And pa! Bye, 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 bye. Number five! PBS, pirates, soldiers, animals in Rome. Number, Number six! six. Fall festival. festival! Games, prizes, bouncy house, candy! Number, Number seven. seven! Relay for life, bake sale, luminaries, running for our loved ones. Number eight! Christmas stories with Mr. Bill! Number nine! Wednesday game nights, games, food, family, and fun. Number 10, friends. Warrens and the Thomases, Nixons and Myers, Hartlibs and Franco, Rollins and Sorrels, Martins and the Pox. Oh, the A Lakes and the Smiths. <laughs> and there's everyone. That everyone. There's everyone so many. Everybody. So we many. can't name all of them because it's <laughs> night. That's right. <laughs> hey, Missouri Street, we love you. And now, um, hopefully, there's a big smile on your face as you usher your minds into a good place, as you roll into a time of singing, a time of uh, communion, and a time of listening to God's Word. God bless you, and we love you all. At that time, Augustus Caesar sent an order to all the people in the countries that were under Roman rule. The order said that they must list their names in a register. This was the first registration taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own towns to be registered. So Joseph left Nazareth, a town in Galilee. He went to the town of Bethlehem in Judea. This town was known as the town of David. Joseph went there because he was from the family of David. Joseph registered with Mary because she was engaged to marry him. Mary was now pregnant. While Joseph and Mary were in Bethlehem, the time came for her to have the baby. She gave birth to her first son. There were no rooms left in the inn. So she wrapped the baby with cloths and laid him in a box where animals are fed. That night some shepherds were in the fields nearby watching their sheep. An angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord was shining around them, and suddenly they became very frightened. The angel said to them, Don't be afraid, because I am bringing you some good news. It will be a joy to all the people. Today your Savior was born in David's town. He is Christ the Lord. This is how you will know him. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a feeding box. Then a very large group of angels from heaven joined the first angel. All the angels were praising God and saying, Give glory to God in heaven, and on earth let there be peace to the people who please God. 
Luke 2, 1 through 14. Oh, Father God, please hear our prayers of thanksgiving. Thank you, Father, for another day in your creation, especially for this day, the day when all your peoples around the world gather to assemble in worship and praise to you, the day we feast at your table of the most precious bread of all, your bread of life. Thank you, Father, for living among us, for teaching us in the way to the truth and the life. Thank you, most of all, your sacrifice, your risen Son, your mercy and grace bestowed on us for our salvation from this world of chaos and decay. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for never leaving me or forsaking me. Thank you, Father, for the missionaries, the brave souls who march into the arenas of evil and proclaim Jesus to the world, no matter the cost, emulating you. Forgive me, Lord God, for not being more like them for not taking advantage of so many opportunities that present themselves to me. Opportunities to ease someone's pain, to fulfill someone's critical need, to simply offer encouragement or to just acknowledge your love to those who ask of me. Father, every day tragedies are falling and compounding on those least equipped to deal with them. Soften my heart, Lord, and embolden my spirit to fight the timidity in me. Help me be brave and wise in dealing with just a small portion of this world. Even if it is a single one next to me or in my view. Help me, Lord, to be ever mindful of the needs around me and be willing to act and proclaim your name. I pray these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. We gather at this moment to partake of the Lord's Supper. I want to share an experience I had a, a week or so ago. I had an MRI done for my, for my brain tumor, and it's about the sixth or seventh one I've had over the last three years. So I've gotten kind of used to them. I can be pretty claustrophobic. And if you've ever had a brain scan done, you know that you lay down and you put your head in a brace and they sometimes even strap your forehead down to hold your head very, very still so that the MRI machine can work. And then I take a little towel and put it over my eyes so that I don't open my eyes and cheat. Because when they roll you back into this little old machine, if you were to open your eyes, the, the wall of the, this machine is literally two inches away from your face. So it's very tight circumstances, and so very claustrophobic circumstances. And I've learned over the last few years that the way to deal with it is to put myself in another place and another time 
and think about something totally away from where I am. So last week what I decided to do was to picture myself on a little walk with Jesus. Spending time with just him, I picked a beautiful lake, a mountain lake, clear crystal water, rocks, logs maybe on the side of the shore, and me and Jesus walking along and sitting on the log and having a conversation. I shared my joys, I shared my fears, I shared prayers about people that I knew that needed special prayers. And while I was doing that, it struck me that every Sunday when I do the Lord's Supper, I usually pick up a, a, a Bible and find a verse, or a lot of times now we put a verse up on the, on the screen up in front of us, to, to take my mind to Jesus and what he did. But wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if every week we set aside during the Lord's Supper a thought process that was just you and Jesus, maybe sitting across that table, having the meal, and him reaching across the table and handing you the bread and saying, this is my body. Take, eat. And handing you the cup and saying, this is my blood. Please take and drink. So that you can remember me and what I've done for you. And doesn't that open a floodgates of, of questions and, and thankfulness of the blessing that he gave us? This morning, what I would like for you to think, when you take of this bread and take of this cup, is to look up toward Jesus in your meditation and say how how did you love me so much that you came to this earth and gave yourself up to die on the cross for me how could you love me that much and the second question that really comes home to me right now is how Jesus can I love with that depth of love let's partake of that bread and that cup would you pray with me please father thank you so much for your son for sending him to this earth to live and allowing him to love me so much that he died for me and gave his body on that cross and shed his blood from those thorns, from the nails, Father, please, show us that love. Somehow, show us that love so that we might love with that depth and that emotion. Father, we thank you so much for that. And Jesus, wow. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for loving us. We ask this through your name, Jesus. Amen.
Mind if I ask you a question? Where do you start to get sober every morning? <laughs> this is where I begin to get sober every day. I crawl out of bed and I find my way into this portion of our kitchen and stand in front of that coffee maker you see over my left shoulder there and I begin to wake up and smell the coffee. And as it brews, I begin to think about the day. It seems as if God's given me another day. Why did He give me this grace? What can I do today? What must I do? What do I have to do? What ought I to do? What do I want to do with this day? Such a gift of grace to be able to think about such things and choose such things. What will I make of this day? It's a gift and it's my responsibility to use it well. You know, this particular time of year, we're naturally probably thinking about doing right by others. We want to give them some grace, some free gift. And we want it to be fitting, something that's right for them, something they can truly use or need. And as we give careful thought to those things, we may spend a great deal of effort in crafting such a gift. That's a good way to think about the way we live each day. God has gifted us with life. And as believers in Christ, we've come to know what real life is about. We've woke up and smelled the coffee. We are alert to the real reality of things. And so what will we give our God in response to his giving us such life? You know, there's a wonderful passage in the middle of a letter that we know today as a book in the Bible. The book is called Titus. Only three chapters, but in the second chapter, toward the end of that chapter, there is a paragraph that might be well known to some of you. It's verses 11 through 14. I want to read it for us right now, and I want to read it from the children's Bible. This is the way we should live. Because God's grace has come. That grace can save every person. It teaches us not to live against God and not to do the evil things the world wants to do. That grace teaches us to live in this present age in a wise way, a right way, a way that shows that we serve God. We should live like that while we're waiting for the coming of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our great hope, and He will come with glory one day. He gave Himself for us. He died to free us from all evil. He died to make us pure people, people who belong only to Him, People who are always wanting to do good things. That last phrase is highly caffeinated, isn't it? Always wanting to do good things. Believers are people who are wide awake and ready to face the day, whatever the day brings, because they know that they are living for the one who did so much for them and who will be coming back one day. And how will he find us waiting? I don't know about you, but I want to be found always wanting to do good things, highly caffeinated. What would such a life in Christ look like? What would a, a good wait for the Lord really look like? The author of this letter, this book, doesn't leave us wondering. He says it in three thoughts. He says it's a way of life that is wise, it is right, and it shows that we serve God. You know, this word that's rendered wise in this children's Bible, in the original language, Greek, it literally means sober. It means clear-headed. All the fog is now dispelled. You're not asleep or stoned, either one. You have your eyes wide open as to what real life is about. It's about Jesus. And so you're going to live for Jesus. And you're not going to let anything fog your mind or cover your eyes a bit to what needs to be done. And then you're going to be about that. And that flows right into the thought of what it means to live a right way. This right way is the righteous way. Paul means just living. That is, living justly toward others. 
we see injustice and we seek to correct it and to right it. We see something that's void or vacant and we want to do the right thing and try to meet that need. We live in such a way that our life is representative of Him who only and always does what is right. And so we express His righteousness. Thereby, we demonstrate that we serve God. That's our way. We're not serving ourself. That's the world's way. And so when God crosses our path with anyone through the course of the day, someone we know or someone a complete stranger, we're going to live wisely and be alert and make the most of this moment so that we can do the right thing and live justly by this person. And so point the way to the Lord and demonstrate that I'm not living for me or for anything. I'm living for Him. He's the one who owns me, you understand. This isn't my life. I don't possess it. It's God. God who possesses it. You see, He bought me. And He bought me with the dearest price that could be paid. His own Son's life. And so I want to be pure. Pure in the way that I think, in the way that I live. Live in accordance with Him, doing right by you. I want to be so zealous and highly active and caffeinated about that, that I'm just doing good things. Good things in the name of Him who is to come. Good things in the name of Him who came and bled and died for me and for you. That's a grace I did not deserve, and you didn't either. But God has given great grace. And now, this moment, this present age, this day you have, it's a gift from God, is an opportunity to be an extension of His grace. It's not just about the season. It's about your entire life and living every hour well for Him. I pray that as you seek this God who gives such grace, you'll find Him. I pray the same for myself. I pray that as we seek wisdom in our life to be really alert and alive to the kind of life God intended for us to, to have and to be about, that we'll find Him in it. And I pray that there are lives that are touched, not by our doings, but by the God who activates us and uses us to the glory of His name. May you and I recede into the background and thrust the Lord all the more forward, always wanting to do good things. Go and do good things, my friend, with grace in peace.